you know, our, our um, entire social and biological reproduction relied on what they called the free goods of nature in, the, in these fertile river bottomlands uh, along Minnesota, the Missouri River, what we call the Missouri River. And so when they destroyed our land, right, they were targeting, they were trying to break our relations, not just with, with the water and the land itself, but amongst our, uh, amongst, amongst our own people. With this book, you've written a thoroughly compelling and accessible text on the Dakota Access Pipeline and the resistance to it with a tremendous amount of context to situate uh, that particular episode in American history. And along the way, you've theorized Indigenous resistance, solidarity, and uh, an Indigenous future, something that we can strive towards. So it is... Uh, on all counts, I think, a significant accomplishment. Mm. Um, But for those of you who may not have been paying attention to what was happening in Indian country uh, south of the medicine line over the past couple of years, maybe it's helpful helpful for you to start by just giving us a brief overview of the central focus of this book uh, and the resistance at Standing Rock to the Dakota Access Pipeline. So Hamantakiapi, Nape Chuzapi, Chante Washte. Before I answer the question, I just want to say uh, thank you for that introduction um, and for being a wonderful host. Uh, um, so the book really begins um, situated in a, in a scene uh, at the Dakota uh, at the Dakota Access Pipeline protests, and it actually begins in Thanksgiving. And there, I don't know if there's, I don't think there's an equivalent here in in Canada, um, but it's. <laughs> It's a thoroughly colonial and racist holiday, um, and it was a very thoroughly and racist colonial holiday um, the day that I talk about in, in um, November of 2016. And it was kind of at the, the tail end of the, the mass resistance that was happening and the more spectacular confrontations with the police. Um, <clears throat> so we went, to the, we went to a mall in Bismarck, North Dakota, and at that time, there wasn't a lot of media coverage um, because a lot of the, the coverage was happening at Standing Rock itself. And the reason why Bismarck is important is because in 2014, uh, the Dakota or the, the Army Corps of Engineers rerouted the, the pipeline path um, north of Bismarck and upriver from Bismarck to south of Bismarck, um, downriver, so that it would, uh, according to their own reports, disproportionately affect the Standing Rock Indian Reservation. Uh, as if there's ever a proportionate amount of risk that one can take. Um, so Bismarck, North Dakota is a white dominated border town. It's actually the capital city of North Dakota and it's 90% white. Whereas um, Sioux County, um, as it's known to the state or the Standing Rock Indian Reservation is around 84% um, native. Um, so it was a clear case of environmental racism, but not only that, It was part of a long history of trespass, whether it's through the fur trade um, or the railroads, and now the present day sort of a North American oil boom. And so we went to the mall in Bismarck to, uh, on Black Friday, which is a a traditional consumer holiday in the United States, to hold a prayer circle and to really remind um, the city of Bismarck that we were still here as water protectors. Um, And we were met with armed guards who had AR-15s um, and not only that, they had mobilized um, the, the sentiments, the anti-Indigenous sentiments of the settler population of Bismarck who began chanting you know, all kinds of racist slurs. They usually only chant at us at um, basketball games, um, but this time for a protest. And so we were forming a, a prayer circle and 33 people were uh, brutalized and arrested that day. Um, it didn't really make any, any headlines but it was really indicative of the, of the confrontation that was taking place at, at Standing Rock, right? Standing Rock wasn't just an, an event. It wasn't just a, um, a moment. It was a movement within a, within a moment, but it was also a moment within a larger movement of history. Um, so the Standing Rock themselves are uh, Hunkpapa and Ihongtawan Lakota and Dakota, respectively. 
um, who are descendants of several ins instantiations of genocide, whether it was the U.S. Dakota War of 1862 uh, to the more infamous or famous uh, Plains Wars of the 1850s, uh, 60s, and 70s. Um, so this was generations in the making, right? And as the Ocheti Shakoi, the Great Sioux Nation, or the Nation of the Seven Council Fires, the last time we had reunified was in a time of war. Um, and some would say that war has never ended. Um, but the last time we had reunified was to resist settler encroachment. And so it was at Standing Rock, at the confluence of the Cannonball and Missouri Rivers, um, where we reunited and lit our fires again. Um, and it was about 150 years in the making. So that's the story I'm really trying to tell is, is the Ocheti Shalkomi side of it. There were a lot of allies um, from other indigenous nations that really made that case um, for you know, the, the 21st century indigenous movement. Um, however, it was, it was uh, our, our movement. And so that's really what I'm, I'm sort of foregrounding in this book. The, the book takes place a couple thousand kilometers south, southwest of, of here. But there's so much that resonated with me when I was reading the book, whether it was the comparisons to I Don't Know More, which I think were just so explicit throughout the text, or whether it's resistance to pipelines, which is actually our present and likely future in Canada. Um, and, you know, you were writing it from a very personal place, and I found myself, you know, not to say that I've been on the front lines of every struggle in, in Canada, but it resonated with me because so much of what you were talking about uh, me and my colleagues and cousins have, have, have gone through uh, and will likely continue to go through. Uh, but for, in this particular case, it was, it was quite personal for you. Uh, you were working on something else. This exploded. You decided to get down there, organize. Yeah, <clears throat> the, the origins of this particular resistance movement um, began much earlier in 2007 as a trace in the book with the Keystone XL pipeline, which is now back on the table. Um, the Obama administration had approved and constructed three quarters of the leg of, of the Keystone XL, but not the one that crossed, crossed the international border um, with Canada, which connects the tar sands um, to our nation. So these forces had already been sort of galvanized around that, and it was really an extension of it. And my personal story is, is in it is because like I couldn't avoid not being a part of it. I had to be a part of it. Um, as indigenous people, we're political by default, just by the mere fact that we are, will always be in the way of settlement and always be in the way of capitalist development. And in this particular case, I, you know, I was born and raised in a place called Chamberlain, South Dakota. Um, I don't know if The Revenant, the movie The Revenant was big here, um, but that, that movie took place or ended actually in the town that I was born and raised in. And, and one of the scenes, um, the final scene of the movie, when Hugh Glass, who was actually a real historical figure, even though the, the movie itself is very fictionalized, um, dances with bears, you know, <laughs> didn't really work out for him that well. Um, he arrives at this fur trade fort, right, um, where native women and children are being bought and sold outside by French, English, and um, uh, French and English traders and American traders. And that really was the first man camp, right? Um, it was a transient, body of laborers who were working in an extractive industry um, and primarily exchanging you know, the skins of furs but also the flesh of women and children. And so when we say things like man camps today, that's really the, the extension of, of these permanent settlements that became border towns, that became the white dominated, dominated settlements that ring our reservations, right, were these same patterns of uh, sexual violence and exploitation still kind of persist, right? And so we are just fighting the next iteration mm -hmm. of that because it was the boom or the, 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 the penetration of capitalism into our territories um, began through the targeting of our relations, our kinship relations with um, the, the animal nations, you know, whether it was the, the beaver um, and then it became the buffalo. And then, you know, it also seeped its way or penetrated its way into our kinship systems, right? Um, and I use a lot of indigenous uh, feminist methodologies to understand this because the, our elders with like, such as like Faith Spotted Eagle and Madonna Thunderhawk have been making these arguments for decades, you know, saying that 
every iteration of capitalist development and a boom always brings a new round, not just of, of dispossession of the land, but also a new round of sexual violence and exploitation of indigenous women, right? And when the capitalists, when the capitalism leaves, they leave capitalists behind. When the patriarchs come, they leave patriarchs behind, right? And so this is the struggle that we're, we're confronting, not just um, not just the, the Keystone XL pipeline or the Dakota Access pipeline, but the long endurance of these settler colonial structures, especially as they manifest in places like border towns and the places that I grew up. Um, so for me, this is a personal story because I grew up on that river. Um, I was told the story of that river, the origin stories of that river. Um, my, my hometown, which I've never been able to see, which is the capital of our um, nation, is currently underwater in that river. And so my grandparents fought the construction of the dams in the 1930s, the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s, and now our generation is fighting the new rounds of dispossession with the creation of the, the oil pipelines. It's like a genocidal Groundhog Day. <laughs> we cannot right. escape. Right. Well, I, well <laughs> we're gonna talk a little bit about that later. Um, so, I mean, all of these dynamics that you're talking about, I mean, we see them in Canada too, w mm -hmm. with uh, the Unistaten, uh clan of the Wet'suwet'en who are trying to stop a natural uh, gas pipeline. They were confronted by a judge who granted an injunction under the assumption that the underlying title of the land, even though it had not been agreed to right. share, the land had not been agreed to share in a treaty is, is uh, can Canadian uh, land and so we have these judges continually making decisions despite the rule of law uh, that violate Aboriginal title and rights and I was I was interested you know to to, to deviate just a little bit uh, about a review that a, a retired North Dakota judge wrote <laughs> about your book mm -hmm. so I'm curious about the audience um, who you wrote the book for it is an it is an accessible book and that's not to take away from its sophistication uh, but it's accessible in the sense that it, you're, you're generous to a, a non-native audience. Um, and so this North Dakota judge wrote a review of your book, and he, said, he, he gave you some praise. And then he said, um, you know, Estes is a very passionate writer with uh, a point of view which my background and experience cannot allow me to share. Nevertheless, this book is a good read in terms of appreciating Estes' advocacy and commentary. Just do not accept everything he writes as being historically accurate. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, in the academy, um, we often we have this process called peer review, right? Um, <laughs> I don't think this judge is my peer, so I <laughs> I'll probably end up in front of his court one day, and I should really be my. I'm in a different country, right? Yeah. Um, he won't ever watch this. No, but I think, that I think he really gets to this embedded uh, mentality that I'm trying to dislodge, right? This, this, it's not just, you know, these aren't just stories, right? This is in, in, these ideas aren't just in people's heads, right? They're manifest in everyday kind of reality and, and especially in the courts of the conquerors, right? We only have to look at this judge and the, the the courtrooms that he sat in and presided. I don't know if I don't I, I don't know for a fact if he presided over water protectors cases, but I do know for a fact that when he did preside uh, over cases, there was a picture of Red Tomahawk above his um, his bench, and Red Tomahawk is the person who assa assassinated one of our greatest leaders, um, Sitting Bull. Um, so the state of North Dakota has um, in the past made Red Tomahawk a symbol of of the state, right? Somebody that they can recognize and, and hold up as their own hero. So these are, the, these are the things, these are the structures that we're working against. But also, I didn't write this book for um, Judge, and I'm glad he read it, you know, uh, more power to him. Uh, he actually read it, and he, he, put all, he pulled out of these quotes that were um, very kind of like, he, he said that the, the, the rest at the Bismarck Mall never happened, even though um, you can Google, the, he wrote this in the Bismarck Tribune, which is the paper of record for North Dakota, and you can Google that arrest and you'll find it in there. Um, but he casts shadow, uh, shadows of doubt also on the resistance itself and its interpretations of history, right? But the thing is, is that he is a state judge. He does not weigh in on cases of treaty. So he is inherently disqualified from 
from weighing in a, a legal opinion on what is, we consider, an international relation, right? Um, and I, I wrote this book, not for people, not for judges, not for conservative judges in, in North Dakota. I wrote this book for uh, my 16-year-old self who uh, grew up in a, you know, in Chamberlain, South Dakota, in a racist border town who didn't have things like this growing up. And so I imagined, I had this kind of uh, imagined conversation with my younger self, but also a real conversation with a water protector, Bobby Jean, three legs, um, with my friend Michelle, who's in the audience here. We were sitting around uh, breakfast one morning, and she was talking about, she was like, what is this settler colonialism? You know, what do you mean by capitalism? And so we began explaining, and she just began narrating her, her experience. Um, and she, I was like, you already know what settler colonialism is. You live it. You already know what capitalism is. You already know what heteropatriarchy is. You live these things. But she just didn't have the language to articulate it, right? She knew enough that things were wrong to organize 1,000-mile relay runs with youth runners to go to Washington, D.C. to tell people that they didn't want a pipeline built through their land, right? But she she didn't use the language of settler colonialism, even though she did, um, she, did, uh, she did know what it means. And to give you another example, one of my really good friends, um, uh, Louis Grassrope, he's my Tahunshi, he's actually in the book. Um, he did a, we did like a community panel with him um, um, back home and he started using the word settler colonialism. Everything's settler colonialism <laughs> now, <laughs> which yeah. is really great. Um, so those are, the, those are the kinds of people that I was trying to reach. Mm. I want to talk about settler colonialism, but just want to continue on with this thread about who you wrote the book for. Um, and really, I guess the importance of, the, you know, we can resist settler colonialism in all of these registers, but, you know, through narrative and through discourse is a critically important register to push back against, mm -hmm. you know, these defenders of settler colonialism. Um, and I guess my question is sort of related to settler colonialism. When I read your book, and then think back on other indigenous histories or the history of uh, uh, indigenous North America, they tend to reflect the sort of um, a, a really a, a darkness of settler colonialism and an inescape, uh, 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 there's no escape from settler colonialism. I mean, I think, I think about Howard Zinn, mm -hmm. uh, I think about Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, which she wrote a brilliant book um, but it is very much, it is a difficult book to read because every chapter is just like, this is what settlers did to native people, mm -hmm. killed us, scalped us, uh, et cetera. You know, even Robbie Williams legal history. I mean, it's also very dark, but, mm -hmm. uh, a thread that I found really refreshing in your book was, was of hope throughout the entire book. You know, it's, it's this pushback against that narrative of, um, hopelessness and, um, I, I wonder if that was sort of a conscious decision in writing the book, if mm -hmm. it was a response to that type of history, uh, or if it just came natural. So I think we're living in an era um, of unbridled sort of neoliberal capitalism, right? And it's choked off alternatives uh, to itself. Um, and it's even affected the way in which we can or cannot imagine a future without the current state of things, right? Um, <clears throat> And I think a lot of our histories and the way that they're written, although we do need them and we do, that, do need that documentary evidence and how the system works, we also have to remember um, sort of the process in which in the 1960s and 1970s in the, in the, red, you know, the rise of the Red Power Movement, the, 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 the horizon of struggle extended beyond the state. It went beyond just state recognition. It, you know, it was part of it, but it was a really an international movement and it really sparked sort of these fires that, could not, that really couldn't be put out. And people weren't really seeking incorporation into the nation state. Some people were, right? And we live in an era right now where that's the end goal. The, the, the nation state itself, the colonizer, is the horizon of struggle. And I think that's really problematic because what happens, how do you get rights and how do you get recognition? You have to articulate and define your injury. Um, and then you have to have the person who's, who's doing the injuring then recognize it and say, hey, that's a really bad thing. And in Canada, you say, oh, we're sorry. Um, <laughs> a few uh, tears. A few tears. And then, they like, then they're like, we're going to hug the murderer out of you. Um, <laughs> but really, that limits our possibilities and what, you know, and what, what a future premise on justice will actually look like. Mm. And for me, I... 
I'm much more interested. It's not that we repeat what happens in the past, but we can learn that at not at all moments of time, right? Even when we go back to the ghost dance, when it was our darkest hour, right? We had, we were starving, we were horseless, we were mo largely unarmed, we were divided, um, but yet we had this revolutionary theory of a world without colonialism, without the United States, um, and without the current state of things, right? That to me is very powerful. And when I think of things like Standing Rock or even this current movement against the Keystone XL pipeline or all of these pipelines, um, is that you had thousands and thousands of young people who experienced freedom for the first time, right? And that's dangerous, because you can't take those things away from them. You can destroy a camp, um, you, can, you can arrest people, but you can't take away that experience of freedom. And I was politicized at an anti-war rally, right, in, in 2003 when the United States invaded Iraq for the second time, and I saw the, the reaction of the police state. And I was, the first, I was 17 years old, I tasted tear gas and pepper spray for the first time. And that politicized me. I could never unlearn that experience. And there was no way I could go back to just s accepting the status quo. And now we have young people who are coming up, um, who are at Standing Rock, who uh, you and I were just having this conversation. They're really radical. And they have visions of freedom that you know, were unimaginable even when I was their age. And that's what's the most powerful. And that's what I'm trying to document in this. It's not a new thing, really. It's just, it's part of this longer traje mm -hmm. trajectory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, you know, often when you're an academic or you're in academia, there is this inability to break out of the theory. Uh, and we've sort of been talking around settler colonialism, and I'm going to get into it directly right now. But I think that you're right with the with the next generation of indigenous thinkers and activists, they're really obliterating what maybe my generation thought settler colonialism was and what mm -hmm. the, po the horizons of settler colonialism were. Um, and so, you know, when I'm invoking uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz or talking about Patrick Wolf, you know, settler colonialism is this uh, monolithic structure. You know, it's not colonialism where the, the colonists leave and there's a period of decolonization. The settlers stay and they try to liquidate the indigenous population and build a new society on top of it. And there's nothing that you can really do to resist that settler colony because it just extends itself in all directions and incorporates your resistance and re-articulates settler colonialism. And it effectively is uh, hopeless, as I said earlier. And, and I think for many years in indigenous studies anyway, this was sort of a, a very nihilistic approach and didn't allow us the space to appreciate or even propose indigenous resistance um, in tangible, material, everyday ways. And I, I just want to read a quote from your book and then draw two questions out of it that I think for me were really uh, impactful. So um, first, well, tradition is usually defined as static or, uh, static or unchanging practice. The view often suggests that indigenous culture or tradition doesn't change over time that indigenous people are trapped in the past and thus have no future. But as colonialism changes throughout time, so does resistance to it. By drawing upon early struggles and incorporating elements of them into their own experience, each generation continues to build dynamic and vital traditions of resistance. Now, settler colonialism endures despite that. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we reconcile this? What are the productive spaces for change? And I think part of the answer that, well, part of what I hope is your answer is around <laughs> the conceptualization of indigenous people, because you mm -hmm. resist the essentializing tendency mm -hmm. of indigenous people and say, you know what, indigenous people were complex and have different, different uh, uh, responses to this very same scenario. And, and I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how, why it was so important to push back against that essentialization. So I really like to ground um, our traditions of resistance in a concept that's now becoming like very popular um, in, in indigenous feminist circles is this notion of relationality. And I try to kind of document it uh, empirically in what it means, right? Um, in the sense of looking at our, our treaty relations, um, you know, our first prophet, our primary prophet, the ones who, who the, the person or the being that made us Lakota people today um, was uh, Te Skanwi, the white buffalo calf woman, and she brought us into correct relations with the non-human world and also the human world. Um, and I look at that, and I look at like how 
you know, if you just, if you're on your phone, just Google um, Lakota people on, and do like a, a, a images search and you'll just see a bunch of dudes in black and white, you know, photographs, right? And how even the perceptions of ourselves um, or the dominant narrative, we've, we've internalized that, that we're a male dominated society mm -hmm. forgetting this long tradition of, of relationality that goes back to, you know, um, our primary prophet, um, Te Skawi. And we look at things like the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty that said, you know, so long as the buffalo shall roam to justify the chase, we shall have, you know, reign over 32 million acres of territory. And we're not just like making this up and like saying, you know, like this was, you know, this is a, we can go back and impose this kind of view on history because the military understood that connection too. They understood that if we undermine indigenous women's political authority and our two spirit, our LGBTQ, um, for us, we have, you know, multiple different gender relations. If we under, undermine that, we also undermine an indigenous political authority, right? And so we've adopted a heteropatriarchal notion of who we are in the past tense, right? But even in our treaty relations, even as even the documentary evidence that exists in the oral traditions that exist that interpret um, that Article 11 of the of the Buffalo Nation says that you know um, Red Cloud said you know Pte means her right it's a it's a it's a female version of a buffalo Pte Oyate her nation and wherever the buffalo you know wherever the Buffalo Nation roams that's our territory that's what Red Cloud said. And so the military understood that connection. They understood that gendered relationship, and they also understood that connection that we had with our relative, the Buffalo Nation. So they understood if there's no more buffalo, then we have no rights to this treaty territory. So they began a mass extermination campaign. Fast forward into the mid 20th century, they understood that you know, our, our um, entire social and biological reproduction relied on what they called the free goods of nature in, the, in these fertile river bottomlands uh, along Minnesota, the Missouri River, what we call the Missouri River. And so when they destroyed our land, right, they were targeting, they were trying to break our relations, not just with, with the water and the land itself, but amongst our, uh, amongst, amongst our own people and trying to force, you know, what Marx calls the proleti proletarianization, force men into, the, into the, uh, the wage economy, force women into the home, um, so by destroying our subsistence economy, because that's how we organized uh, our political authority at that time. How you eat, where you eat, where you get your food is directly related to how you relate to the land and how you relate to each other. Um, so these were targeted destructions uh, it, at every instantiation. And so we can see why, you know, Two-Spirit and LGBTQ activists weren't just symbolically represented at Standing Rock but they were actively central to the organization of the camp itself. Some people called it a coming home. I talked to one activist who had, hadn't been home to Standing Rock. Uh, she was Hunk Papa Lakota. Hadn't been home since the 1970s because of the, the anti-gay um, discrimination that he, she had faced in her own homelands, right? Um, and now we are, we are living uh, an indigenous movement that says heteropatriarchy is just as unten uh, untenable as U.S. occupation of our homelands, mm. and that it's representing a reconnection, uh, a form of relationality that we haven't seen, you know, if ever, I would say. And it's, it's a new conception of who we are. It's a, it's a tradition in the best sense, right? It's, it's the selection and reselection of ancestors, but it's also a projection into the future because these people know that they want to be good ancestors to the, the coming generations. Mm. And that's the ultimate sacrifice or the ultimate goal or a life goal of a Lakota, right? To be a good relative, not just the here and now, and not just in the past, but also to the future. Hmm. I think, you know, so much of what you are describing is the re revitalization of, you know, sort of authentic indigenous protocols and traditions, and it's difficult to navigate what is, uh, uh, what is authentic and mm -hmm. what isn't. Um, but I, I think in, in reading your book, it's, it's very clear that that has to be a part of the resistance to settler colonialism. Um, and I appreciated your sort of, your, your, the theoretical intervention. And I think it builds on the work of, of people like Shiri Pasternak, mm -hmm. where <clears throat> settler colonialism responds to indigenous resistance 
uh, indigenous resistance response to settler colonialism, and there's this co-constitutive dance that goes on, and, and we're always looking, as I said earlier, for the break out of that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's only a recent uh, phenomenon that we started to think about settler colonialism that way. Uh, and, I was, and I was wondering about your conceptualization of the ghost dance mm. as a strategy out of that loop. Um, and, you know, it's one where we take something that is authentic or traditional and apply it to contemporary circumstances, but also blow up these conceptions of what it is to be Indigenous, uh, at least in, in, in under the mainstream gaze. So, uh, again, I don't... Uh, as I said to you before, I don't want to appropriate the ghost dance for this particular uh, context, but I, I do see it as a, a compelling contemporary framework for mm -hmm. resistance under the structural notion of settler colonialism. So if you could talk a little bit about that. So there's, there's parallels with uh, the current movement that's very much youth-led in the sense that when we think of the ghost dance, we, we don't think of the, the young people that were involved. And that's what I really tried to uh, document in parts of that, that chapter that you're talking about. Um, in the sense that it was boarding school trained indigenous youth who ran away, who learned how to read and write and speak in Lakota, or in Lakota, but also in, in, um, in English. And they were, it was a very much a modern movement in the sense that they were sending letters to each other and translating the, the prophecy and the songs um, and the visions of Wavoka, the, who, who was the Paiute uh, um, prophet of the ghost dance. So it was very much a youth movement in that sense. And it was a, a direct response to the, the reservation era at that time. And it also provided a vision of a future um, where, you know, they, they said the, the world would be wiped of, you know, white settlers and the, all of our nations, all of our, our relatives would return. Not just human, but non-human, the buffalo would return. Um, and it's been a distorted, it's been a distorted uh, prophecy, and it's been a, uh, John Neidhart, who is a poet, wrote this book called Black Elk Speak, which is a semi-true book, but he fabricated the most quoted elements of that book in the sense that he had a fatalistic view of the ghost dance, saying that we were a nihilistic culture that was trying to return to a past that never existed, et cetera, et cetera, and Black Elk mourned when he saw the ghost dancers strewn across the bloody snow, at Wounded Knee in 1890. But Black Elk never believed those things, and he never said those things. He believed that the ghost dance prophecy may not have been fulfilled in that generation, but it didn't mean that tree of life um, that he envisioned died at, at Wounded Knee, that its roots were still spread in the ground and rooted in the ground, and, and in the forms of taking ceremony underground and taking language underground and taking these things underground, but also this idea that, that there is an essentialist or an authentic you know, experience um, of, of indigenous people. We wouldn't think of children who had their hair cut and who were speaking English as main participants in this particular movement. Um, and we would say that today. You know, why is it that you know, we are reinforcing these binaries of authentic indigenous experience and un inauthentic? In, in the States, you know, about four out of five native people don't live in Indian reservations or federal land, but that doesn't make them less indigenous, but they're also living on indigenous land and they're reestablishing forms of relation to places like cities um, or reestablishing relations and redefining relations with each other. And that's what you know, I'm trying to complicate in this, in this story is that it's not just these, you know, these perfect you know, binaries of who's the authentic Indian and who isn't, but it's often those who are most dispossessed and even the Red Power Movement though, was formed out of a lot of uh, indigenous people on relocation whose lands were flooded, right? They couldn't, there was no home to go back to. So what do you do with that, you know? Um, who do you become out of that? And, you know, we experienced that, that kind of question as, as indigenous, as a family who had their, our homelands, you know, inundated and our, our lands taken. There's no home for us to return back to and the animals themselves have been destroyed. So it's a re envisioning and a reimagining, right? We've lived several apocalypses, mm -hmm. whether it was the, the, the fur trade, the buffalo, um, the genocide of the buffalo or the damming of our river, and now this new apocalypse of, of the carbon infrastructure that's mm -hmm. being built. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, just as you were speaking, and also when I was reading the book, it, there was, you know, for us as Nishnabek, we have 
uh, Mishi Bijou, the underwater panther, and Nimki Baneshi, the, mm. the thunderbird. And basically when humans get out of line, they come together, <clears throat> the, wa the, the uh, water, the land, and the sky, to hold us accountable. And, and sometimes that can be um, devastating ecological uh, catastrophe, for, for people at least. And then once that uh, erodes or subsides, then, then the, the land comes back and maybe the people can come back. Um, so that in, in some ways, that's an apocalyptic vision, but mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure how to describe it because it's a, what we're talking about is a different, uh, a different sort of transformation right. rooted in large-scale transformation that benefits us as humans, but also our, our relations. And I think the most powerful book, I mean, our, our, part, one of the most powerful parts about your book, in addition to how you wove together settler colonialism and white supremacy and heteropatriarchy was very clear reference, yes, minor accomplishment. Uh, <laughs> the uh, emphasis, the urgency of recognizing that we have about 10 years before the planet decides to swallow us, mm -hmm. before Mishi Bijou and Nimki Baneshi return, mm -hmm. uh, and we've got to do something about it. And, and uh, one last quote before I know that we've got to uh, open it up for questions. Um, I mistakenly said you're drawing on Glenn Coulthard before uh, before we began this, it was it's actually Russell Russell Means that Glenn Coulthard was drawing yeah. on. Um, <clears throat> so Minnie water as life exists outside the logic of capitalism, whereas past revolutionary struggles have strived for emancipation of labor from capital. We are challenged not just to imagine, but to demand the emancipation of Earth from capital. For the Earth to live, capitalism must die. I know a lot of these talks, people will get up in the question and answer and say, you know, what can we do as an ally? And then you make a pretty clear call mm -hmm. for solidarity. Mm -hmm. Do you want to end by expanding on that call? Sure. I guess since we're in the heart of the snake pit, right, if we're talking about the black snake, um, the snake pit, as uh, my friend Rob Nichols described it, is coming out of the tar sands in Canada, right? Um, Canada owns 50% of the mining uh, companies around the world, and they're not just putting um, oil pipelines through our, you know, the Trans Canada pipeline through our homelands, but they're also building dams. Uh, they're they're using they're building uh, nickel mines in like in Guatemala against indigenous people there. Um, and for us, for as indigenous people, when we talk about decolonization, everyone is like, oh, that's an indigenous problem, you know, decolonization. Is, is a form, I would argue, a form of settler onticide, meaning destroying the settler world, not like settler people themselves, but all the privileges that are granted, not just like, I'm not talking about just social privileges, right? Not getting shot by the police as much as native people, but the legal in implementation of these laws that are always counteracting against indigenous authority and against indigenous sovereignty, right? And if we look to places like Standing Rock, and not just, the sta not just the Standing Rock movement, but the Keystone XL movement, um, and the movement in, in the Black Hills Alliance, there were key uh, alliances made with non-Indigenous people who had a vested stake, right? Uh, and for uh, treaties, I know, understand treaties are much different in the States than they are in, in Canada, but um, we recognize also that treaty rights, in, at the end of the day, are really the only thing that a lot of these white folks who are living on our land uh, as uninvited guests it's the only legal mechanism they have to resist these pipelines and to resist the contamination of their drinking water. But we don't do what the settlers did to us. We didn't we're not going to genocide them. You know, we didn't dispossess them from their land. Um, and we didn't you know, take their, their most precious, we didn't take their children from them. Um, when we created the camps at Standing Rock or we created the camps in the Black Hills, we invited them into this struggle, um, not as you know, you know, our, you know, our white slaves or anything like that, but as, as allies, as equals into the struggle. And that's something that we have to begin thinking about. And um, I'll just leave with this, you know, this, this story of uh, in 1974 at Standing Rock, the American Indian movement was facing, you know, mass rep repression um, by the state, by judges like those who reviewed my book, because <laughs> they were caught up in the, in the courts of the conquer. And it was almost as if the U.S. indigenous movement was crushed at that particular moment. And the elders um, who asked the American Indian movement to come to Wounded Knee in 1973 had worked with a sympathetic um, tribal council at Standing Rock 
um, the, probably the only tribal council that would deal with AIM at that particular moment, and said, we want to take our treaties to the world court. And they didn't know how. So how do we do that, right? Um, the Palestinians came. The South African anti-apartheid movement came, right? The Irish, the, the, Irish, or the Irish Republican Army came, right? The Nicaraguan Sandinistas came, right? And these, at this particular moment, and of course it got more complicated as time went on, but at this particular moment when settler society had largely turned its back on the indigenous movement, um, we did what we did best because Lakota means ally and friend, right? We made relations with the rest of the world. Um, and we wouldn't have documents such as the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People had it not been for um, the South African anti-apartheid struggle and specifically the Palestinian struggle. And so in this particular moment, as Indigenous people, we have every right to make relations with whomever we want. Um, as, you know, and there's, there's complications to that, but I, I wanna put that out there because this isn't a, just an indigenous problem, right? They always defined it, we're the, we're the difficult people, right? We're the Indian problem. Um, but this is your problem too, as non-indigenous peoples. You have all been invited into the struggle.